Few of us ever get to be living legends. I think it takes, first of all, a certain aura. It takes a certain... You have to be, you have, you have to be a, a legend, I guess, before you become a living legend. And then you have to go off uh, somewhere where, where uh, you sort of disappear for a long period of time. I kind of think that's what Ray Palmer did when he quit the Ziff Davis Publishing Company where he was head of their fiction group. He was editor of Amazing Stories, of Fantastic Adventures, of other fiction magazines they had when the company decided that they were going to move to New York, Ray began to make other plans. At the same time, I was editor of Flying Magazine, and I didn't want to go to New York any more than Ray did. And together, we tried to work out a common venture, and that venture was Fate Magazine. I think Ray mostly contributed the concept, and I contributed the name. And many people have asked me, where did the name Fate come from? And it came from uh, a list of names that move people that had been published in Fortune magazine. And we thought, Fate is one of the words that move people. And you have to understand that we looked upon this as professional publishers, and I, at least, became hooked after we started Fate magazine, and not before. Ray doesn't make many public appearances. He's off in Amherst, Wisconsin, on his farm, with his own private life, with, uh, with his own dam, generating his own electricity. And I don't say he's completely self-sufficient, but he achieves a lot more of it than the rest of us. Ray is editor of Search Magazine, Ray Palmer's Forum, and Space World. For many years, he published Flying Saucers, which was a UFO periodical. He has emerged, if I am correct, as the foremost exponent of the earthly origin of UFOs. He early advocated, and he can correct me again, the two pole, polar regions as the location of hidden saucer bases. Ray created a major sensation in science fiction by publishing the accounts of Richard Shaver, who claimed he had visited the inner earth and discovered a whole new civilization. The Shaver mystery and Ray's subsequent endorsement of inner earth theories created a continuing controversy among UFO enthusiasts. And I may say I've been braced on it several times uh, today by people who say, well, what about this inner earth? And, and what about that? What about the people who live inside the earth? It was Ray Palmer who commissioned the early writings of Kenneth Arnold on the 30th anniversary of whose sightings this conference is based. Ladies and gentlemen, Ray Palmer, a legend in his time. Electromagnetic, among other things. <laughs> I felt when I when I first came, became the editor of Amazing Stories that I wanted to reach the younger people. <clears throat> so I got into the sort of uh, cowboy sort of uh, science fiction, which offended a great many of the people, like Heinlein and so on. And uh, although I can say I bought Isaac Asimov's first story, it's the only one he ever sold me because. 
he didn't want to be associated with the kids that uh, I was reaching. Anyway, uh, um, about 1943, I got a letter from a man named Richard Shaver who said he had an ancient alphabet which was common to all languages and would I publish it? And I did. And this is, I think, where the UFO first got its start because I got hundreds of letters from people saying this alphabet is really unique because I've tried it out in various languages and it really does work as Shaver said. Well, what Shaver said briefly is that the English language is the origin of all languages and I think any professional in the audience will tell you that's absolutely wrong, that English is a derivative, a derivative of all of the languages that preceded it from the Sanskrit on. Well, I tried it out myself and I tried it among the staff of Zip Davis and uh, they were very amazed. A reporter came over from the Chicago Tribune and he tried different words on me and said, use the alphabet and, and decipher them. Well, he used languages that I'd never heard of before and I deciphered them correctly. And he says, you know what you're doing? You're reading my mind. Well, I wasn't reading his mind. I was using Shaver's alphabet. If I had been reading his mind, I would have considered it to be an even more amazing thing than, than finding an alphabet, which was a common denominator to all languages. So I wrote Shaver and I asked him where he got the language. And that's where I got the surprise of my life. The letter he sent back was 11,000 words long. It was called A Warning to Future Man. And it claimed that Mr. Shaver had spent eight years in an underground civilization in the caves and that there he had met two types of people. One were the Darrow. Now D is a symbol for disintegration or destructive. And Rho is a shortening of the word robot or robotic. So that a, a Dero is a robotically controlled human being. Uh, conversely, a Tero is, which T was just integrative, and you can s compare it to the cross of Christianity if you want to, but it is, it, it is constructive, and persons guided by T are, are robotically controlled for good. Well, he said that he had spent eight years down in the caves with these people. And his warning to a future man was what these people had told him about how it came to be that they were down there. It seems that around 12,000 years ago, the Earth was bombarded by radiation from a solar flare of great magnitude, and life on the surface became impossible because of radioactivity. So the first thing they did was retreat underground in vast cities that they built with their tremendous science. But it was necessary to use surface air and water and gradually these underground cities became contaminated so the only answer was that they had to flee this planet so they built spaceships and the privileged ones were able to leave but the, the bulk of the population was abandoned and they were termed in by Shaver the abandoned Darrow now these were the people who, among whom he says he lived for eight years these people had access to the tremendous scientific machines that were left by this super civilization that left the earth. And they were using them to detrimental purposes because their minds had been uh, affected by the radioactives and their thought was negative instead of positive. The best example I can give you of that is the Boy Scout who said to the old lady, I'm going to take you across the street. And by the, which his intent was good, but by the time he got to the middle of the street, the radioactives in his mind had made the thought turn around and become evil, and he pushed the old lady under a truck. Now that's the type of thinking that goes on, says Shaver, in the caves. So I didn't think it was a very uh, good environment, and I didn't think much of the people. But many of my readers in reading the stories began to tell me, as a matter of fact, when we published the first story, we got 50,000 letters saying that not only was Shaver telling the truth, but thousands of them claimed to have also been in the caves, and they confirmed his story. Well, Mr. Ziff, who read the first story, called me into his office, and he said, Ray, these are my magazines. I'm not going to allow you to ruin them. You call this story a true story, and you know it isn't. 
And I, he says, I'm, it's going to destroy our circulation. So I said, Mr. Ziff, will you allow me to ask my staff to bring in the letters that we've received on this story? Well, it took uh, seven or eight people to bring them in, and there was a tremendous pile on the floor in front of Mr. Ziff. And he said to me, Ray, the only thing that I'm disappointed in is why didn't you promote this thing the way it deserved? <laughs> well, I did promote it over the next four years, and we raised the circulation of Amazing to 185,000 from a beginning of around 75,000, and we held that. But I'm going to tell you something about the way we raised that circulation, which is another thing that got me uh, more and more convinced that Shaver really had something. This was during the war, as if Davis was short of paper. And the pulp magazines with circulations up near a total of eight million with nine or ten titles had sufficient paper to carry Ziff Davis publications uh, far in advance on the quota system of any other publisher in the country. Well, Mr. Fuller's magazine, Flying, was one of those magazines, and it needed paper. So they stole the paper from me. They stole the paper for popular photography. And they had enough magazines to flood the newsstands and became one of the leading publishers in the country simply because they had paper, all due to Mr. Shaver. And here's how Shaver got the paper. I told him we didn't have the paper because of the war, so we couldn't print extra copies of Amazing Stories. And he said, no problem. I'll just contact the Darrow. He says, what's the name of your circulation manager? I said, Mr. Strong. He says, okay, Mr. Strong will give you the paper. And the Darrow somehow put the thought in Mr. Strong's mind that this particular issue we ought to come out with 50,000 extra copies of, of Amazing Stories. When Mr. Davis heard of this, he was furious because we were harming flying and popular photography. And he said, Ray, you know these, these cock and bull stories are not going to sell. So I said, well, you call Mr. Strong and see what the circulation reports are. And he, he called Mr. Strong, and Mr. Strong said, you know, we have received an order from the American News Company for 100,000 additional copies of this magazine because they had sold it out. And Mr. Davis, without altering his tone of voice in mid-sentence, said, in, in effect, Ray, you're ruining my magazine, but I don't understand why you haven't given it the proper promotion. He says, let's get behind this thing, Ray. You're missing a great opportunity. Now, how could I tell Mr. Davis that the reason we had all this paper was because a Darrow down in a cave had directed a Telog ray on Mr. Strong and made him take the paper back from Mr. Fuller. But I became interested in Mr. Shaver now because when you produce a phenomena like that, you're not talking about an art ordinary person. So I went to Pennsylvania to visit Mr. Shaver. And I found out that uh, he was a very simple man. He was a hell of a good chess player. I never was able to beat him and uh, certainly nothing wrong with him mentally. And while I was there, we talked until about 2 o'clock in the morning. Then he took me up to my bedroom, and it turned out it was a bedroom which I had to go through his bedroom, and there was no other way out. So I was stuck in there. Well, his wife had to go out and feed the numerous animals and chickens that they had, and about uh, 3 o'clock she came back up. But he went to bed at 2 along with me in his bedroom, and I left the door ajar, because he told me about all these voices that talked to him, and I wanted to hear them. And to my utter amazement, I did. Mr. Shaver apparently went into a trance, that's what I would call it. I heard five voices speaking, a young child and, a, and two, two women and two adults. And the subject of their conversation was that four miles down, four miles away, somebody had been torn in the four quarters by horses that afternoon, and this was a very terrible thing, and it shouldn't be allowed to happen. Now, I agreed heartily. So I said, yes, I agree, this shouldn't happen. And instantly the voices changed, and the little the child's voice says, pay no attention to him. He's a jerk. <laughs> and then they began talking in a language I didn't understand. But later on, they reverted back to English, and they went through the same rigmarole again. And I said, let me in on this. What's it all about? And again, uh, I was called a jerk. Well, after an hour, Mrs. Shaver came upstairs, and the voices ceased instantly. And I might add that when these voices were talking, sometimes all five would be talking at once. Now, if this was ventriloquism, 
or it was Shaver's vocal cords doing it, it was quite a stunt. Well, they stopped instantly when Mrs. Shaver came up, and I, I went to sleep, and that was it for the rest of the night. When I got up in the morning, Mr. Shaver asked me how I slept, and I didn't want to spoil my act, and I wanted to stay a few more days, so I said I slept fine. And he says, I thought they would, because I thought you would, because I told them not to make a fuss while you're here. And I said, for Pete's sake, Dick, let them make all the fuss they want. Uh, the next night I went to bed and I slept like a rock, which I never do. And I found out no more as far as the voices are concerned, except that I was convinced Mr. Shaver was hearing real voices. Well, I went back to Chicago and we began running Shaver's stories. And as the uh, Shaver mystery progressed, he told me about the science that was occurring in the caves. And here I'm going to get to the flying saucers and the relationship of science fiction to flying saucers. He told me that in the caves, they had tunnels connecting the various caves. Tunnels sometimes hundreds of miles along, crisscrossing the entire United States, and as a matter of fact, the whole world. And these tortures curved uh, caves with their many uh, obstructions and rough walls were traversed by what he called a rollat. A rollat is a vehicle that is robotically controlled. In other words, it operates uh, without a pilot. And they floated about a foot off the floor of the cave tunnels. And they traveled about 1,500 miles an hour. And when they'd reach a turn in the tunnel, they would make this turn at 1,500 miles an hour. And I couldn't understand why even the Darrow weren't crushed against the walls of their craft. Well, it was about that time that Mr. Uh, Arnold made his sighting. And Shaver called me up and he says, you see, I told you they'd travel that way. And he says, this, they do come out on the surface and they finally have come out. He says, you know the peculiar method that they traveled, which is very similar to the, to the rockets that we have today, which the Russians are so concerned with because they follow the contour of the surface of the earth. Uh, perhaps 50 to 100 feet above it, and they, when they get to a tree, they zip right over it, and they don't, uh, they don't contact and wreck themselves. Well, you can understand why Kenneth Arnold was confused at the way these things have traveled. To Mr. Shaver, it was, it was triumph itself. I had, I had the proof right there in my hands. But at the same time, I also had another proof, and it was a very disturbing one. I got a letter from a nurse who was a nurse in the Ypsilanti State Hospital for the Insane in Ypsilanti, Michigan. She said, I know Mr. Shaver very well because I was his nurse during the eight years in which he was incarcerated. You can imagine my consternation at this point. I'm dealing with a madman. I'm dealing with a schizophrenic, with a paranoid person who has spent eight years in a catatonic state, living in a world of, in his own imagination, now, how can I go on with the Shaver mystery, uh, as treating it as a reality, unless I, I, I assume that what is happening to Mr. Shaver is the very same thing that is happening to many of you out there when you say you are contactees or when you, uh, you hear voices. I asked my readers to report to me what the voices said, and I asked how many of them heard voices, and by using the formula that advertisers use to tell how many people are reading their magazine so they can sell an ad on that basis and know what to charge, I concluded that there were 20 million people in this country who heard voices. So I contacted about a hundred of them and I asked them to, re them to report to me weekly what the voices said. And to my utter amazement, I would get dozens of reports on the same day of people who had heard the voices from people widely scattered all over the country who heard the voices say identical words. Now, if Mr. Shaver was a schizophrenic and the voices were in his own mind and all of these other hundred people were schizophrenics, the voices would be saying different things, if I am correct in what psychiatry believes about it. So then I had to conclude that not only wasn't Shaver um, a psychopath, but that he was rehearing voices which were real. And what else could I conclude that they must be in the caves that he's talking about. Although by then I had decided they weren't in caves. I, I had come across a book called the Waspie. In a Waspie, which deals with the uh, history of the earth for the past 79,000 years and the history of the heavens for the same period, it speaks of the spirits of the dead 
are floating upward to various levels or plateaus depending on their development. And between these plateaus, the Ethereans would construct what they call roadways and tra travel between the plateaus along these roadways was by vehicles exactly similar to the things that Mr. Shaver described as traversing the tunnels and Mr. Arnold said he saw along the Cascade Ranges. And they made these same peculiar fluttering motions. Now I'm beginning to put two and two together. We're not talking about two different things. We're talking about uh, a psychic phenomena and yet a real physical phenomena because Kenneth Arnold is very adamant when he says that these were machines. And I think Stan Friedman will say the same thing. I thought Mr. Hynek would say the same thing, but to my astonishment, he has converted himself almost entirely to the psychic uh, phenomena in regard to flying saucers. Now, I want to get into some, uh, into a little, uh, into the diversion that the clever Mr. Fuller knows I will get into. And I want to say that I want to retitle this speech, The Stymie Factor. Well, Kenneth Arnold and I are very familiar with the stymie factor. And this is the element of ridicule. I think this is the thing which Arnold and I have lived with for 30 years, and which is the reason I have not appeared in public in a group such as this. Because when I get to the things I'm about to touch upon, I know that among you, at least 50% will get a glazed look in your eyes. Some of you will have to go to the bathroom. And you will leave, and you will not come back. Now, I, I, I made a speech like this once before, and you can believe that I'm saying a factual thing or an allegorical thing, if you wish. But in the midpoint of my speech, I found that I was entirely alone. You know that when you are in the bathroom singing, how wonderful you sound. Well, I heard my voice reverberating from the walls, and it sounded wonderful. And I talked for two hours. And after I got through, I stood up and gave myself a standing ovation for ten minutes. <laughs> but the, the stymie factor is what I really want to talk about now. And it is stymied every one of you, I'm sure. My first uh, real encounter with the stymie effect was when I stood on a stage similar to this in Chicago around 1950. And I debated the flying saucers with Willie Lay. And I brought to this debate what I thought was, was as good evidence as we had at that time. And I was very sincere about the, taking the positive side of this debate. And Mr. Lay asked me a question. He said, how do the flying saucers fly? And I thought, you've just given me the opening I want because I've just told you about the different ways they fly uh, in Shaver's tunnels, in Owaski's uh, roadways in, in the atmosphere and in Kenneth Arnold's uh, sighting over the Cascades. They fly like this. But Mr. Lay didn't give me an opportunity to describe it. He withdrew from his pocket, having come very prepared for the debate, a saucer, a minus cup, of course. And he tossed it into the air and fell to the stage with a crash and broke into a hundred pieces. And there were 2,000 people out there laughing. And there was no possibility of me continuing effectively in my end of the debate. So I think I did a very uh, unworthwhile thing then. I'm not really proud of it. I turned around in my thoughts and I did all I could to help Mr. Lay demolish me. Just a month or so ago, one of the fan magazines, maybe the editor is here and guilty of it, said that in 1950 or so, Willie Lay demolished Ray Palmer on the, on the debate stand, and he did. And that is why it happened, because I was so stymied, so frustrated by the ridicule that I decided it was not worth my time to waste it on those 2,000 people who had a good laugh. And Arnold, uh, I think, can tell you the very same thing. If, if he doesn't stick to his, to his nuts and bolts, he'll get the same glazing over and the same desire to go to the bathroom. Well... Uh, I've been in this, shaver, in this uh, saucer thing longer than, sh than anybody. I predate Mr. Arnold by three years because I knew about the flying saucers from Mr. Shaver. This is my 33rd anniversary. Well, fans began to feud about uh, the Shaver mystery and about the flying saucers, 
and it even got eight pages in a in a May issue of Life magazine in 1952, all of which was uh, of the kind of thing I call the stymie factor. We were being ridiculed. Well, now I want to go. Few of us ever get to be living legends. I think it takes, first of all, a certain aura. It takes a certain. You have to be. You have. You have to be a, a legend, I guess, before you become a living legend. And then you have to go off uh, somewhere where, where uh, you sort of disappear for a long period of time. I kind of think that's what Ray Palmer did when he quit the Ziff Davis Publishing Company where he was head of their fiction group. He was editor of Amazing Stories. And many people have asked me, where did the name Fate come from? And it came from uh, a list of names that move people that had been published in Fortune magazine. And we thought, Fate is one of the words that move people. And you have to understand that we looked upon this as professional publishers, and I, at least, became hooked after we started Fate magazine and not before. Ray doesn't make many public appearances. He's off in Amherst, Wisconsin, on his farm, with his own private light, with, a, with his own dam, generating his own electricity. And I don't say he's completely self-sufficient, but he achieves a lot more of it than the rest of us. Ray is editor of Search Magazine, Ray Palmer's Forum, and Space World. For many years, he published Flying Saucers, which was a UFO periodical. He has emerged, if I am correct, as the foremost exponent of the earthly origin of UFOs. He early advocated, and he can correct me again, the two of fantastic adventures of other fiction magazines they had when the company decided that they were going to move to New York, Ray began to make other plans. At the same time, I was editor of Flying Magazine, and I didn't want to go to New York any more than Ray did. And together, we tried to work out a common venture, and that venture was Fate Magazine. I think Ray mostly contributed the concept, and I contributed the name. Pole, polar regions, as the location of hidden saucer bases. Ray created a major sensation in science fiction by publishing the accounts of Richard Shaver, who claimed he had visited the inner earth and discovered a whole new civilization. The Shaver mystery and Ray's subsequent endorsement of inner earth theories created a continuing controversy among UFO enthusiasts. And I may say I've been braced on it several times uh, today by people who say, well, what about this inner earth? And 